And I'd like to start with this video, which is a fasciculation potential captured by high density surface EMG. And it's slowed down by about 80 times. And what I really like about it is it shows the high temporal and spatial resolution of the amplitude profile that you can get with this setup. And I think that really underlies a lot of what I'll mention today, the computational power uh, that, that this affords is immense. So I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. I want to talk about the motor unit, its relevance to ALS, and then probably the most exciting part is what can we do in the future to learn more about this disease? So the motor unit is uh, the fundamental building block of the peripheral motor system. The cell body resides in the ventral horn of the spinal cord and that anterior horn cell projects its axon uh, distally towards the skeletal muscle. And the motor unit involve, includes that cell body, the axon, the axonal projections, and the, the terminal arborization, including the muscle fibers that they each connect to. And some very old data here looking at uh, human cadaveric samples shows the huge diversity depending on which muscle you're looking at in terms of the number of muscle fibers per motor unit. And also Again, relatively old data, this time in cats, showing that each motor unit um, it works over quite a large surface area of the muscle. Uh, and there is variable distribution of, mo of muscle fiber innovation. And so the knock on effect of this is that motor units overlap bringing it right to the modern day, uh, the group in Newcastle have been doing some pioneering work with motor unit MRI. So they've got an MRI set up that can capture individual fasciculation potentials on MRI, which is really quite remarkable. Um, and this gives new insight into the uh, anatomy of the motor unit. So in any introduction to a motor unit uh, discussion, I think we have to touch upon the physiology um, and put simply uh, the action potential um, results from a combination of opening and closing of the sodium and potassium channels. But it gets more complicated than that clearly. And the uh, saltatory conduction uh, as the impulse travels down the axon means that there are different densities and different types of these channels within the node, the paranode, and the internode. And we have to be mindful of this when we come to interpret some of the excitability data. Okay, so how can we detect motor unit activity? Well, the traditional method is through needle EMG. Um, and uh, a more modern method, which I'm going to focus on today, is the high density surface EMG. And the advantages of this latter approach that really attracted us as clinicians and researchers is that uh, it's non-invasive, therefore it's not painful, it's more comfortable for patients, does not induce any bleeding. You get a more comprehensive assessment, we feel, with longer time periods because patients tolerate it much better. And this also means that patients don't mind having this done repeatedly, which is a real bonus for a disease that changes really quite rapidly over the course of a year or two years. And as I've already alluded to with my first video, you build up a, a much more a much richer 3D image of what's going on. I, I explain this to my patients as though we have 64 eyes all looking in on the muscle. 
And so we like to think of it as the stethoscope of, of neuromuscular medicine. So this was just some simple data um, we performed in collaboration with our in-house uh, neurophysiologists. We asked an ALS patient um, to have needle and high density surface EMG performed simultaneously. And I think what this depicts quite nicely is that uh, you can certainly see the same potentials on the surface that are being detected uh, below, but also that you're getting a much richer spatial um, data set. Um, uh, and I think that's really important. And the figure in the bottom right is our, our attempt at trying to put this into the topographical array um, that aligns with the sensor itself. And so touching upon morphology, um, this is really just a simple set of recordings um, taken at the surface and just from one of the channels on the grid. But I wanted to highlight some of the morphological variations that you can get. And so a simple fasciculation will go up, down and back to baseline. And we can detect that multiple times in a single recording. We've detected at, at times variations in that simple morphological profile. And we think this might be a sign of sort of uh, axonal block within the terminal arborization, although this needs a bit more investigation. And then you get complex fasciculations and you'll note the change in the y-axis. This is a much larger amplitude and it's clearly got some complexity with uh, ups and downs and it's much longer. And this is an important point to sort of emphasize at this point, especially in ALS, there is compensatory re-innovation. And what do I mean by this? Well, if you take motor unit one, which connects to a series of muscle fibers and motor unit two, which has an overlapping um, innovation. What if motor unit two dies? Well, what we know happens is that motor unit one has the capability to uh, take on the role that motor unit two had. And therefore you've now got eight muscle fibers as depicted here, um, innovated by a single motor unit. And what this means is that motor unit one's morphology every time it fires changes. And so we're hoping that we can try and detect some of these complex changes over time in ALS. Okay, so what about the relevance of the motor unit to a disease like ALS? Um, now we know that there is uh, an urgent need for reliable biomarkers in this disease. So just to give uh, a few snapshot uh, bits of uh, data. So ALS affects one in 350 people at some point in their lifetime. And so in the UK, we will see 1200 new diagnoses a year. Um, and it really involves degeneration of motor neurons. And unfortunately, this leads to progressive paralysis and death uh, with a median survival of three years from symptom onset. In Europe, we only have one licensed drug, Rilizol. I know in the US and Japan, they have a Daravone as well. Um, but the therapeutic benefit from these is very modest. And so biomarkers can give us a way of int introducing them into clinical trials as a way of monitoring whether a new drug works. So how has the biomarker development tackled uh, this in ALS? Well, you can look at axonal loss, and we're just showing here the atrophy associated with the first dorsal enterosius um, and the thena eminence in a patient with ALS. And although these motor unit number assessments don't use high density surface EMG, I think that they're well worthy of discussion um, it, on this topic. Um, so motor unit number index is, is really um, the most well characterized of the motor unit number estimates in ALS. And uh, the group in St. Gallen uh, under 
the mentorship of Professor Weber have, have helped to push this forward. Um, uh, and they've shown that Munich's declines more sensitively over time in both spinal and bulbar onset patients. And also crucially in pre-symptomatic muscles. So those that are still strong, they are detecting a decline in Munich's. And that's quite remarkable. So this disease, you know, is, is definitely well established before weakness even occurs. And so Munix has been adopted now as an outcome measure in a large multicenter clinical trial. The, uh, another type of motor unit number estimate is the M-scan fit. And uh, this is me having it done. Um, it's, uh, it involves high frequency uh, pulses um, and um, right from super maximal currents down to zero. And what you can see on the graphs on the right is that a normal smooth profile in B is that of a healthy individual, whereas in ALS you get this fragmented um, curve uh, and this can then be uh, turned into a measure of motor unit number. Uh, and reports suggest a classification accuracy uh, that is very favourable. Um, and I just wanted to touch upon uh, this concept, which is that we all know motor units have subtypes, um, uh, but in mouse models of ALS, two papers have really stood out showing that there is selective vulnerability of those motor unit subtypes um, that are on the faster end of the spectrum. And the thought being that they are more energy demanding and therefore they um, succumb to the disease more quickly. And so the take home message really from this bit is that not all motor units are equal. And I actually think there's a lot of work that can be done on the motor unit number estimate techniques through the use of high density surface EMG that can really tease out um, this a bit more um, because uh, we really have to focus on the fact that motor units are not equal in this disease. Okay so what else can you detect and this moves on to more of some of the work we've been involved in. Well hyperexcitability. we know fasciculations are a key component of ALS um, and I've got here just a few videos from patients. Um, in fact the first three are not from ALS patients, they're from my benign fasciculation syndrome group. Um, and I will say to any clinicians out there, if, if a patient sends you a video of a twitching muscle, it's almost pathognomonic of a, a benign disorder, I would say. Um, that's my experience anyway. So what about fasciculations in ALS then? Um, this is of an ALS patient and you can see florid fasciculation there in the biceps and surrounding muscles. And we know that fasciculations are one of the hallmark clinical signs of ALS and they're present at early stages of disease before significant neuronal loss has occurred. And it's due to a, an impairment of sodium potassium balance across the membrane um, and a tendency to, to um, uh, send an action potential when it's not meant to. So this is our high density grid in situ on the calf. Um, uh, and that's the purpose of that video. So um, what have we done recently? Well, we've conducted a longitudinal assessment over 12 to 14 months. And we asked patients to come back every two months for up to seven visits. And we looked at uh, functional rating scale, MRC power score, and a slow vital capacity. That's a measure of breathing. So these are fairly standard measures clinically of disease. And then we uh, performed high density surface EMG for 30 minutes for four muscles. So biceps, brachii bilaterally, and medial gastrocnemius bilaterally and we perform Munix in a selection of muscles as well. And our uptake was, was reasonable. Um, so we, we managed to assess 80 to 85% of patients uh, four times. 
but you can see the drop off um, does increase at the end. Unfortunately, three of our ALS patients died during this uh, one year of monitoring. So prior to setting this up, we'd actually devised this tool called SPIKE, um, which stands for the Surface Potential Quantification Engine. Um, and this is a tool that's designed to take 30 minutes of high density surface EMG data and convert it into um, a, a fasciculation um, count. Um, it also gives us analysis of amplitude, but crucially this is in an automated way. And we can also detect noisy parts of the recording and when the patient has not fully relaxed and these are taken out again in an automated way. So this was the tool we were really going to use to assess fasciculations. A little bit about our cohort. So you can see that in terms of our clinical measures, there was a consistent decline uh, in patients. And uh, I'll just raise this point that our functional rating scale declined by about 0.65 uh, points per month, which is about 35% slower than you would expect. So this is a slower uh, uh, a, group, a cohort with a slightly slower progr progression rate than average. So what did we find from our fasciculation analysis? Well, fasciculation frequency was a key measure. That's just simply how many fasciculations per minute were we detecting? And I'll try and talk you through some of the analysis here. So um, on the x-axis, we have months into the study, zero to 14, and on the y-axis, fasciculation frequency in numbers per minute. And then I'm going to show you the output from our mixed effect model uh, for a series of muscles. So we have first the biceps and our control benign fasciculation group. And they, as you'd expect, had very low fasciculation counts and they didn't change over time. Our strong ALS muscles uh, had fasciculation counts that were 10 times higher, but actually we did not detect a significant change over time. And then in our ALS weak muscles, we saw a much higher baseline, 40 times greater than our control group. And we saw a steady drop off over time. Um, in gastrocnemius, the pattern was different. We saw a higher baseline in our control group. And then in strong ALS muscles, um, we uh, saw a five times jump, but actually there was a steady decline already in strong ALS muscles in gastroc. And that came very close to baseline in the weak muscles. So there's something very different in the physiology of these two muscles. We also looked at fasciculation amplitude and what, what the, uh, the spike program does for us is it, is it computes a histogram or visualizes a histogram uh, of the amplitudes. This is simply the peak to peak amplitude. Um, and uh, what we found was that ALS recordings often created this sort of bumpy profile on the histogram, whereas our BFS cohort always produce this sort of slow um, smooth curve and so we uh, we put numbers to this uh, finding um, in that we just found the median and the interquartile range of the fasciculation amplitude and then what we did was we looked at a series of, uh, of different groups so we had our bfs control group and then we split our ALS muscles into a pre-weakness group, as shown here by the pre-column. And they were muscles that stayed strong at every visit that we saw them over the year. The peri-group are those that started strong and then became weak at some point during the study. And the post-weakness group are those that were weak at the start of the study. So what we're trying to do is introduce some chronology um, into uh, the uh, disease progression. And we found this quite a useful way of doing things. Uh, and we showed that amplitude median steadily rose until the very latter stages of disease, 
And we think this might be due to just overwhelming motor unit loss, including of those motor units that, that are particularly large. Um, but the spread uh, of um, amplitudes actually just carried on increasing throughout the disease, but only in biceps. So we saw no significant change in gastroc. So gastroc almost served as a bit of a, a control, actually. Okay, so those were our sort of main outputs. And then we tried to put this together into uh, as, as tightly knit a, a model as we could. And so I'll just talk you through this. So we had our benign fasciculation syndrome group uh, where we know there is no neuronal degeneration, but we know that there is a tendency to fasciculate. So they have a, a relative hyperexcitability that probably is shared by most motor units. And the electrical bolts there on the, the, um, uh, the diagram depict that. And so we measured three th main things. We had muscle power, we had our Munich, which was our motor unit number assessment, and then we had fasciculation frequency. And in our BFS group, it all just stayed the same. In our ALS group, we propose that in early disease, there is already motor unit loss because we're seeing a decline in Munich. And we saw that in our cohort as well in strong muscles. As a compensatory effect of that motor unit loss, the surviving motor units are undergoing re-innovation as we highlighted earlier. Um, and so you're starting to see an increase in amplitude. And we were seeing an increase in fasciculation counts uh, at this stage. So we're sort of right at the start of a, what, we, what we termed a rising phase of fasciculation frequency. In the middle part of the disease, you've still got continued motor unit loss and continued compensatory re which has become quite extensive at this stage. So you're seeing large, complex motor unit potentials. Um, but a tipping point is reached. This compensatory mechanism cannot go on for too long. You're probably always, uh, also maxing out on your hyperexcitability at this stage. Um, and so in the latter stage, you enter this falling phase of fasciculation counts, um, probably driven mostly by just overwhelming motor unit loss. If you've got fewer motor units, you cannot produce as many fasciculations. Um, and of course, at this stage, you will see your clinical signs of atrophy, um, which will be quite profound. But the disease is already very advanced by this stage in that muscle. So we, we, we sort of introduced this rise and fall pattern of fasciculation frequency. But actually, independently, this um, group, Vesquez Costa et al, using ultrasound data and modeling, had shown, had suggested a very similar thing. Um, and I wasn't aware of this paper until we got all of our results through. So it was, sort of, it was um, justification i suppose um, and they showed that as muscles initially got weak fasciculations potentially go up but then there's a slow decline so i think almost certainly uh, that it's a non-linear pattern okay um so we've also looked uh, at this data in a slightly different way so We've actually, at the time that we performed this analysis, we'd seen 31 ALS patients um, across not only that core study that I mentioned, but some other ones as well. And we predicted each of those ALS patients' uh, prognosis using a very well validated NCALS model, which came out two years ago now, validated on over 11,000 patients. And it takes eight clinical or genetic um, parameters available at diagnosis. You can go online um, and input them there and it will provide you a median uh, survival per patient. 
So we thought we'd do this for our 31 ALS patients and then see if any of our fasciculation measures correlated. Um, and interestingly, we, uh, we devised this um, parameter called the rate of change of fasciculation frequency. And this is simply the fasciculation frequency divided by the time since symptom onset. So we were trying to get a feel for how quickly is, a, is the patient developing hyperexcitability. And we, we showed quite crudely, um, and we need to go on and do more prospective studies here, that those in the higher median with this rock off um, score had a worse prognosis than those in the lower median. Um, and the hazard ratio came out at sort of 1.1. Um, so uh, a lot of work to do there, but could this be potentially a prognostic indicator? Okay, so um, just coming to the final section in terms of future approaches. And we've got lots of ideas, so I could only really touch upon a few. This is one study that actually we've collected the data on, but we're, we're um, continuing to analyze. And this is a collaboration we've formed with uh, Dr. Hodson Toll in Manchester. And she's, uh, she's particularly interested in ultrasound um, of muscles in ALS to detect fasciculations. And in fact, has devised an automated tool uh, to do this. So we teamed up and thought about simultaneous high density surface EMG and ultrasound. Um, and I highlight here just some very preliminary data showing that where we could detect correlated fasciculations by both methods, um, as you'd expect, um, these were closer to the, the surface. Um, so the green correlated fasciculations compared to the uncorrelated ones above. Um, and so we're really tackling this data now to, or probing it to, to look to see if we can find um, some key properties of the electromechanical um, connection um, uh, that, that, that might uh, be a useful biomarker or, or give us some indication of what's going on in ALS. And then another big component of our work um, is high density motor unit decomposition. So um, we teamed up with a group in Texas, um, a group of bioengineers who, who have um, one of these codes. Um, and what we're able to do is, if we ask a patient to voluntarily contract at, at low force levels, we can then decompose um, the motor units uh, from the high density grid. And lots of groups are, are doing this, but we're, we're doing it particularly you know, in the mindset of ALS. Um, and so the code will produce a series of motor units and a tick for where it thinks they're firing. And this then allows you to probe the firing characteristics of, of multiple motor units uh, simultaneously. And we've shown just uh, some unpublished data here, but um, in weak ALS muscles, there seems to be this shift to higher frequency. So those with a lower interspike interval, that blue group there. Um, compared to strong muscles and controls. Uh, so this is likely to be a compensatory mechanism to motor unit loss. Um, and then uh, I think we can take this many steps further. Um, the STEP protocol um, looks at trying to crudely assess over a short period of time um, motor unit function at varying levels of force, right from sort of low levels at 25% of the patient's maximum, right up to 100%. And I think if you then decompose each stage, we could get a really nice insight into which motor units are active at varying levels. Um, and this is just a grid uh, showing how the, uh, the code produces um, a motor unit template, if you like, which you can then um, investigate the morpho morphological characteristics. Um, and then almost finally, um, I, I do have a strong suspicion that because of its advantages, surface EMG and in particular high density um, could really have a role 
in home monitoring of ALS. And this is another avenue we're exploring. Um, but there's lots of excitement more generally in ALS um, about monitoring patients from home um, with um, sort of their respiratory function, um, you know, telemedicine and lots of ideas. So can we sort of tap into that uh, momentum? So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that um, you know, motor units are the fundamental building block and I think we have to um, think of new ways of, of analysing them. Um, the motor unit number estimation field has been around for many decades and I think we can add on um, extra utility if we can think about how high density surface EMG can, can tap into that and we've got some ideas um, which we can discuss with individuals uh, if they wish. Um, and the non-invasive nature of the technique really makes it very suitable to monitor patients over uh, many time points. Um, but undoubtedly, we need to put this into the context of a multimodal approach. So by that, I mean clinical assessment, biofluid assessment, imaging, um, uh, and all those other things that, that tell us about this disease. And so I'll bring you back full circle to the uh, original video, um, which I still think is very nice. I've seen it a million times. Um, there are some references which you're welcome to um, email me for. Um, and this work really couldn't have been possible without many, many people, um, particularly my mentors, um, Professor Chris Shaw and Professor Kerry Mills at King's. Um, and then with particular mention to uh, funders, Medical Research Council, the Motor Neuron Disease Association, uh, under the guise of the Lady Edith Wolfson Fellowship Programme, um, which were the key driver for this work. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Bescher, for your great talk. Uh, we received a couple of questions during the presentations. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I will go through them one by one, um, so you can uh, uh, you can uh, answer them. Um, sure. If you have if you have uh, if there are additional questions from the attendees, uh, just use the Q and A button below or press the uh, raise your hand button in the center bottom of the screen and I can mute you. Um, let's see, we have uh, two questions. Um, the first one is uh, from, and I'm already apologize in advance for the probably mispronunciation of the name, Seung uh, Yeon No. Um, and the uh, question is, uh, ALS and BFS are diseases that directly affect uh, muscles and High density EMG is used to better understand the symptoms. Then, how about other diseases? For example, can the spasticity after a stroke be measured by high density EMG? And furthermore, can high density EMG be used for the analysis of, uh, uh, of those symptoms? Yeah, so uh, I think it's a really interesting question. And um, uh, I think the short answer is yes. Um, I, you know, I. I have huge confidence in the non-invasive approach and I think we need to collect as much data in across many disease groups as we can. Um, I, I did have one of my master's students um, come to me saying he'd moved to a new hospital and there was a stroke consultant who was keen on using this. Um, so I need to follow that up because uh, I, I think you know, spasticity could be an area where um, where, where this could uh, sort of bear fruit. Um, and the reason I say that is because we see spasticity in ALS. Um, and I did uh, just anecdotally find that ALS patients found it much harder to relax on the EMG um, uh, over long time periods. And remember, we're recording for half an hour per muscle to patients so, so on the couch for hour, hour and a half. Um, they found it much harder to relax than our control patients. And I do just wonder if that's a manifestation of 
a their hyperexcitability uh, in their neurons, but but possibly also their upper motor neuron impairment and spasticity. Um, so so yeah, I, I think it all needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Uh, to follow up on that, uh, last week we had a, a webinar from uh, Professor Ying Chung Zhang uh, from uh, University of Houston, um, uh, specifically about this topic. So probably we will get in touch with uh, with the, the, the person who asked the question to uh, well to get them in touch or to to discuss this uh, application yeah. more. It sounds like a perfect person, yes, to get in touch yeah. with. Um, Another question uh, from the same person. Ah, uh, by the way, there was a second question in the, in, in the first question. Can I see this webinar again? Will the video be uploaded to the site? I recorded the, the, the webinar, so we will get in touch to make sure you can rewatch it uh, or, re, or see it again. Um, so the, the, the same person with uh, the, uh, another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Spike of the motor unit. Uh, seems to be directly related to the brain signal. Have you seen any example uh, example comparing motor unit data measured from high density EMG with EG data uh, such? Um, so, no, we haven't done that. Um, we are planning to try and understand the cortico muscular um, axis in ALS in more detail and we're doing that through uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation studies so we have a PhD student right now um, who she's sort of halfway through a pilot study in healthy volunteers before COVID reared its ugly head um, and we hope to get back to that but crucially that should set us up for another longitudinal study in ALS patients and um, using what we, we've termed a high density TMS. Um, so that's transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, uh, and we hope that, that that might tell us uh, a few details about how stimulation at the cortex transmits through to the muscle. Um, but what we're also doing in that study in conjunction with our epileptologists and our EEG um, uh, specialists is uh, TMS EEG. Um, which to our knowledge has not really been well studied in ALS um, and uh, so we may have some data that that would relate to your question in the near future but at the moment we don't. That would be very interesting of course uh, yeah. as you know of course you know, the system you have is perfectly capable of measuring both uh, high density EMG and EG even at the same time so uh, yes I mean, we could even even. Uh, well, maybe that's a discussion we we could have. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Um, a third question, uh, last question for now, um, from uh, uh, Leo Hogendorn. Uh, great presentation, Dr. Bashford. Thank you. Uh, how do you explain the morphology changes in fasciculation? Are these due to increased jitter in the reinnervation process? Yeah, so, um, you know, the reinnovation process is not uh, a sort of faultless process, I imagine. Um, you know, the, the, you've got to imagine the neuromuscular architecture being thrown into this state of almost chaos um, with motor units declining um, in function, um, their capacity, their physiological reserve all waning and then eventually just becoming inexcitable. Um, uh, and denervated muscle fibers, my understanding is that there is some sort of biochemical release which then attracts new sprouts um, from surviving motor units. It's probably not all types of motor units that can sprout. Um, you know, it's probably those with a more um, a greater physiological reserve, maybe those on the slower end of the, the phenotype. Um, uh, and, and we're we're, we're trying to analyze some of that uh, at the moment um, uh, by looking at recovery cycle um, properties, but more on that at another time. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I think jitter and axonal block, um, which could be intermittent, are probably all going on in these immature branches as they struggle to sort of re-innovate uh, what, what I like to call orphaned muscle fibers. Um, 
but you know, jitter, uh, maybe it's something you can look at with high density surface CMG. It's not something we've focused on. I understand, you know, it needs more invasive techniques, um, but I'm happy to be corrected on that. Um, uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a chaotic process. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we have, uh, I have, I have one question. So I'll yep. just, just use uh, my, uh, my screen time for that. Um, the, uh, do you see any role of, uh, for high density EMG in the diagnostic process of, of, uh, ALS or, um, yeah. it's only for, for, uh, well, monitoring the progression of the disease yeah so um i left it out of this talk but we've actually just submitted a paper that looks at that um precise question so um rather s similar to the prognostic um slide that i had um at a later time point we 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 just thought well we, we've seen quite a few als patients now and quite a few controls including healthy participants um and so our numbers are something like 39 als 17 healthy participants, and then eight neurological controls. And we just asked a simple question. At the first time we saw each of those individuals, can we distinguish ALS from non-ALS? Um, uh, and we could um, with, with quite high accuracy. And the best parameter was fasciculation frequency. Um, and so uh, our data showed that um, results, uh, fasciculation frequency of over 14 per minute um, was quite a good cutoff um, for the disease. Uh, but there are many limitations with our methodology there. It was retrospective. Um, there is an age difference between our two groups. And so we really have to take that preliminary uh, information forward and say, right, what's the meaningful clinical question? Well, it's when patients are undergoing diagnosis in our clinics that's when we want to be assessing them with this new technique and seeing if it can really help make a diagnosis earlier um, so yeah we, we've got we, we've got a view to doing that um, and i think it makes a lot of sense because fasciculations we know are a very early feature of the disease and actually if you ask a clinician a neurologist whether they would be comfortable diagnosing als in the absence of fasciculations, they would be very wary. Um, and so I, th I think it's a really good thing to tap into to, to look at that very early stage of disease and, and therefore diagnostically it fits in perfectly. Okay, thank you. Uh, that sounds, uh, sounds very interesting. Um, with this question, uh, the webinar has come to, to an end, I, I guess. Okay. No questions any further. Um, uh, thank you all for joining this uh, the second webinar in the TMSI Expert Talk uh, series. Uh, before we close this session, uh, some final words from my side. I hope you all enjoyed uh, the webinar. Um, if you have any questions left for Dr. Bashford or um, for TMSI, uh, feel free uh, to, to email them to uh, info at tmsi.com. Uh, we also invite anyone to contact us uh, if you are interested in a one-on-one -on -one, one call about how we can help you with your with your research. Uh, the next webinar, uh, the next webinars uh, are planned for, uh, for the next one is uh, planned for next week, and we are working on the uh, the ones after that. Uh, the next talk will be uh, by Professor Michel van Putte uh, from the University Twente uh, and uh, Medi Spectrum Twente. He will talk about uh, early EEG for neurological prognostication of uh, post coma in the ICU. Um, please uh, subscribe all. Uh, you can find the link on teamsi.com or on our LinkedIn page. Um, also keep a close watch to your email box uh, because we will uh, be announcing new webinars soon. Um, before we really close this webinar, I would like to uh, give a last thank you to uh, Dr. Bashford, uh, thank you for your presentation and time. Um, and uh, of course, also to our audience, uh, I want, uh, want to wish you uh, all good remainder of the day. And of course, I hope to see you all soon. Um, stay safe uh, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.